Thank you, Sheila. And uh, I want to begin by reiterating uh, Secretary Kerry's comments um, this week. Uh, you have the, on, on behalf of the NED, and I think the entire audience, you know, really extend to Canada our condolences and our solidarity. And there's, I don't think anything that better embodies the, the friendship uh, between Canada and the United States in this lecture and in, in, Marty's, uh, in Marty's legacy and tradition. I want to uh, begin by thanking our co-sponsors, the Albert Shanker Institute. Randy Garten is here from the Shanker Institute and also the Johns Hopkins University Press, which is represented by Bill Brecker tonight. Um, I also want to thank Melissa Aiton Becknell, uh, who is on the NEDS uh, forum staff, the International Forum, for all the work that she did in organizing um, this event. And she may even agree with some of us at the NED that the Nats defeat had a silver lining in minimizing the distraction of tonight's seventh game. It would have been very terrible had we had that kind of a distraction that we don't. Uh, and of course, I also want to especially thank uh, the uh, Embassy of Canada, Sheila and Niall Cronin, for all the help that they've given in organizing this event. And then again, especially the government of Canada uh, for its uh, steadfast support uh, for uh, apropos of tonight's lecture for uh, Ukrainian, Ukraine's territorial integrity, its democracy, its sovereignty, and of course for Canada's very, very powerful um, opposition to the Soviet, there to Russia's illegal actions, almost said the Soviet Union. I also want to recognize our very dear friend Sydney Lipset um, and to note that she's made available outside and the table in the back. Uh, booklets of Marty's writings, including his autobiographical essay, Steady Work, uh, and his joint article with Georgi Bentz, um, which uh, anticipations of the failure of communism, which touches on the whole issue of Russia and the Soviet Union. And I feel confident that Marty uh, would have been thrilled by the choice of Lilia Shevtsova as tonight's Lipset lecturer, because she's not only a brilliant scholar and writer, but also a very courageous defender of democratic principles. Marty would have relished the fact that Lilia has not been afraid to speak the truth to her own government and also to Western leaders who have not demonstrated real resolve in responding to the Russia's uh, aggressive uh, actions. Lilia also has a great sense of timing her last NED talk which took place on March the 19th, which was the day after uh, Putin's menacing and revanchist Kremlin speech, the March 18th speech. And I'll never forget how passionate and eloquent she was on that occasion. And tonight she's speaking in the immediate aftermath of Putin's Valdai speech in Sochi, which the Washington Post yesterday called and I quote, a poisonous mix of lies, conspiracy theories, thinly veiled threats, and fur of further aggression, and above all, seething resentment toward the United States. And so the spotlight has returned to Russia, despite all of the other crises erupting in the world that compete for our attention. And we await with great anticipation how Lilia will interpret developments in her country and what they mean for America, America's security, and also for the future of democracy in the world. And before I call on Mark to uh, introduce Aliyah, I also just want to note one additional thing. October 30th, which is tomorrow, is the day of commemoration of the victims of political repression in Russia. It was it made that as an uh, annual date um, by the Russian parliament in 1991, and on that occasion, on this occasion, the evening before, so tonight, actually right now, or maybe a few hours before, given the time difference, the organization Memorial marks uh, marks the occasion by reading the names of all the victims of the great terror who were killed in Moscow. Uh, there were 30,000 of them. Uh, it takes 12 hours, and it takes place in Lubyanka Square, which is directly across the street from the KGB headquarters, where there is now a stone from the Solovki Island, which was the prison camp and part of a main prison camp and part of the Gulag. 
So, so today this is going on in Moscow and with many of our friends there reading the names of the victims of Stalin's terror. And I guess it's also important to note that the justice uh, ministry uh, in Russia today is calling, uh, calling for memorial to be shut down, which is part of the problem that Lily is going to talk about. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce Mark. Thank you, Carl. Uh, it's an enormous pleasure for me to be able to introduce Lilia Shetsova, who tonight will present the 11th Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. For almost two decades, Lilia has been based at the Carnegie Moscow Center, where she's chaired the program on Russian domestic politics and political institutions. As it happens, however, at the end of this month, She'll be moving next door, at least in terms of Washington geography, to the Brookings Institution, where she will be a non-resident senior fellow. But as the non-resident part of her title suggests, she plans to continue to base herself primarily in Moscow. Prior to joining Carnegie in 1995, Lilia was a professor at the Higher School of Economics and at the Moscow Institute of International Relations, as well as Deputy Director of the Institute for International Economic and Political Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and Director of its Center for Political Studies in Moscow. She's been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, a visiting professor at Cornell, Georgetown, and the University of California at Berkeley. And she's also an associate fellow at Chatham House in the UK. Lilia, I'm pleased to say, has been a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Democracy since 2000 and a regular contributor to our pages since 1995. Whenever we have a thought of publishing anything about Russia, we turn to her for advice, and she invariably steers us in the right direction. She's also on the editorial boards of other journals, most notably the American interest, for which she's recently been writing some extremely interesting and eloquent essays. Uh, in researching her bio for this introduction, I discovered that Lilia received her PhD from the Academy of Social Sciences of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. In 1976, that was, in the midst of the Brezhnev year. And after having made it through the era of stagnation, she then would experience the roller coaster ride of the Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and Putin years. Closely monitoring the political scene during these epical changes, she deepened her understanding of the importance not only of institutions, but of personalities as well. She's written illuminatingly about all three of these presidents, as is reflected in the titles of several of her books. These include Yeltsin's Russia, Myths and Realities, published in 1999, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and Putin, Political Leadership in Russia's Transition, published in 2001, uh, Putin's Russia, published in 2005, and Russia, Lost in Transition, the Yeltsin and Putin Legacies in 2007. Lily is unquestionably one of the world's preeminent analysts of the Russian political scene, with a profound knowledge not only of the country's inner workings and day-to-day -day politics, but also of the comparative and theoretical issues raised by Russia's peculiar trajectory. Despite having been trained in the days of Marxism-Leninism, uh, she's thoroughly mastered the political science lexicon of democratic transitions and consolidation, or perhaps I should say non-consolidation uh, in the case of Russia. Uh, thanks to her close study of the political evolution of Russia, she's even broken new theoretical ground in this area. In looking back over her contributions to the Journal of Democracy, I was especially struck by the fact that in 2000 she wrote an article for us entitled can electoral autocracy survive? 
and then in 2000, another article entitled Russia's Hybrid Regime. These formulations remarkably anticipated the journal's publication in 2002 of a set of influential articles among the most uh, frequently reprinted that appeared in the journal, uh, written by Larry Diamond, who's here with us tonight, Andrea Shedler, Shedler and Stephen Levitsky and Lukin Wei, uh, articles that broadly conceptualized a new category of regimes combining democratic and autocratic features, variously labeled as hybrid regimes or as electoral, electoral or competitive authoritarianism. Subsequently, especially since Vladimir Putin's return for a third term as president, Lilia has traced Russia's descent into an increasingly harsh form of authoritarianism, largely devoid of any democratic features. This is the dispiriting reality that she will describe and analyze for us this evening, not only exploring what it means for Russia, but also considering the challenge that it poses to the liberal democracies of the West. But before calling her to the podium, I want to say a word about Lilia's qualities of character, which may even surpass her gifts as a political analyst and a scholar. Carl, of course, has preceded me on uh, this ground, as I suspected he would. Lilia's independence of mind, her commitment to telling the truth, and her courage really are remarkable. She's not hesitated to speak plainly about the abuses and the failing of, failings of Russia's rulers, even amidst the nationalist fervor that has swept the country in the wake of its annexation of Crimea and its depredations in eastern Ukraine. This would be one thing if she were in exile, but she continues to return to Moscow and to speak out un as unflinchingly as she has always done. And her example, I think, gives us some hope that all is not lost in Russia. Lydia will speak for about 45 minutes and then has agreed to take some questions from the floor. Lydia? Well, you know, It's good sometimes to be reminded about some periods in your life. Well, I definitely have to write about my communist uh, stage, and especially when I worked for the Central Committee. Uh, you know, you downgraded me. I worked for the political bureau. Well, <laughs> and uh, now returning to a much more serious topic. First of all, Sheila, I want to join Carl and express my condolences in regards to what happened in Ottawa. You know, it happened so that I was in Ottawa just the day before the hell unraveled. And I spoke to my friends, just look, what a sleeping, quiet, boring city. I'm sorry. And then it happened. Thank you, and thank you, thank the embassy and the Canadian government to host meetings in Ottawa and I would like to thank National Endowment for Democracy for all the efforts, not only to organize my event, but to organize annual event, you know, uh, reminding us about great men. And first of all, I want, well, Sydney, Sydney, thanks. Thanks to you for your friendship, for your inspiration, and for the fact that you're helping us a lot, and for the fact that you are a companion and friend of this great personality. Well, it is the honor, and it, of course, it is privilege for me to deliver the annual Seymour Martin Lipset Memorial Lecture. And I have to admit that I'm very nervous, and I feel that for me today, it's a great responsibility for two reasons. Firstly, because while in times of intellectual wobbliness in times when, as far as I see the reality, community intellectuals, academic community, political community has lost its trajectory. I have to remind you about great personality, the man of ideas and principles, and remind you about his legacy. 
and do it without preaching and lecturing and find the adequate tone to talk about him. And secondly, I do believe, maybe I'm wrong, I want to be wrong, that we still are in a kind of interregnum. I'm using this Marxist term again, Gramsci, interregnum, time outside of time. When the old ideas, not only institutions, but ideas, have to be dusted, thrown into a dustbin, because, well, they are not relevant in a lot of areas anymore. And the new institutions and ideas have still to emerge. Institutions and networks have still to be formed. And so this is the time, and here, you know, the metaphor of Polish-British sociologist, Zygmunt Bauman comes to mind. He uh, described this time in a fallen way. Imagine, he says, you are flying on board of the airplane. And suddenly, you had a chance to look into the cockpit. And you found that there is no pilot. But still, you don't know that the airport you are destined for has not been built yet. And it struck, you know, this metaphor that it explains at least the way I feel myself in our, in our reality, the way I'm trying to look for answers and cannot find the adequate answers or the answers, responses that I will be, I will be satisfied with. That's why well, I'm looking at Carl, I'm looking at Mark. You wanted and you chosen me to hear the response, to hear the formulation maybe of recipe. And I have to confess, I don't have answers to many questions that Putin, Russia, and the current reality has arisen. Well, but in any case, having made this uh, confession, I will proceed. And I will start with a very simple premise. History can be a nightmare. History can end up uh, as a great dust heap, unless it is interpreted, interpreted by intellectuals, and you see, I'm quoted already, Darendorf, intellectuals with the ability to see the, to see the roots of the trends and of the twists that tendencies are making, and predict how they will intertwine. And so Martin Lipset was such a translator of history. I even wanted to say he was making history, but definitely he rendered history, he made it comprehensible for intellectual and political community. He was also, uh, at least in my mind, he was a scientist with a barbarian sense of mission. Because reading and rereading him during the last couple of months, I thought that for him the most important was, you know, to base his assumptions, to base his travel across the regions, countries, disciplines, in this sense, he was a free swimmer, typical Manhattan, typical free swimmer. You know, uh, he based his assumptions uh, uh, on values, on ethical dimensions. And, of course, this proved that he had intellectual honesty. I suggest Russia today and the Russian system of personalist power for our discussion. And when I'm using the term the Russian system of personalist power, I mean not only Putin, Putin's personality, phobias, you know, fears, complexes, his leadership, not only his regime. I have in mind also the system of entrenched interests combined with the political regime. I have in mind traditions, moods, hopes, anticipations, and of course, the social basis of the Russian personalist power, one man rule and tradition, definitely tradition, of course. And uh, uh, thinking about that, uh, uh, I thought that uh, uh, apparently looking at current Russian reality, Martin Lipset would definitely use this book and will write continuation, uh, chapter number two or the second book, continuation, the sequel, because definitely he will raise a question uh, that he was raising in this book, the book that is called Anticipations of the Failure of Communism, one of the most, most timely books nowadays. Because here, Lipset 
is raising the question about failure, about intellectual failure, failure of academic community, failure of intellectuals, experts, journalists, and politicians. He asks why Sovietologists had failed, failed to predict the destiny of the Soviet Union. They thought that the Soviet Union was durable, and resilient, that it would survive rages, centuries, etc., and they failed. And here's what he's uh, saying in this book, I, I quote, trying to explain why Sovietologists went wrong. He wrote, the scholars, I'm quoting, looked for institutions and values that stabilized the polity and society. Whereas, he says, they should have emphasized the dysfunctional aspects, structures, behaviors, which might cause a crisis. And you know, uh, thinking about this book and looking at the uh, current reality, I see a lot of parallels. And uh, I see a lot of periods and a lot of areas where I personally was wrong, totally wrong, and I have, I have to make confessions where exactly. But we also have to understand and we have to admit that, you know, uh, intellectual and political community, at least dealing with Russia, Eurasia, Ukraine, transition, post-communism, finally post-Cold War settlement, they were so often wrong because they failed to predict what was going to happen in 2014. And uh, trying, uh, trying uh, to deliberate, to follow both tracks and to point strengths and weaknesses of the Russian system, uh, I think that it will be easier for me now. It will be easier for one reason because it so happens that the Kremlin trying to uh, reproduce the system, trying to strengthen the system, trying to, uh, uh, in fact, give it some kind of resilience is at the same time is undermining it. Well, to understand is to perceive patterns, wrote Isaiah Berlin, and it seems to me he understood. He was in the same cohort with Lipset. And in order to demonstrate Russia's pattern, I will address the following questions in my presentation. And I promise, Mark, 40 minutes. If I do 45, you just, well, you get me out of podium. So firstly, what is the nature of the new challenge that Western democracies are facing today? Secondly, what makes the Russian system unique? And what are the reasons for its failed transformation? Thirdly, what are the survival mechanisms of the Russian system? And fourthly, could it be transformed or it is doomed to perish, to go down in flames? So let me start with the first question about the nature of the challenge. There are so many evidence, and I'm not going to give the least of them, so many evidence that we are dealing with a system at the stage of decay. System and civilization at the stage of decay. It has neither ability nor strength it has no readiness to uh, reform and transform itself. However, comparing with the Soviet Union, even in 1991, it is not ready to leave the political scene peacefully. Just on the contrary, it's going to fight, it's going to battle, it's going to um, sacrifice the well-being of its own population, and it's going to undermine the rules of the game. The President Putin and his last Valdai speech, and here I have friends who would correct me if I am wrong, because they saw Putin delivering it. I just read, I can't see him anymore. So while well, he said that, Putin, I'm quoting Putin, we are experiencing change of the global order and the growing space of chaos. Angela, Toby, how he looked when he spoke it. Not happy, okay, of course not. But this is very interesting, very interesting statement because it shows that at least leader of one nuclear superpower, Russia still is a nuclear power, uh, believes that there are no rules of the game. And if there is no rules of the game, the world order has crumbled, okay? That sounds a bit apocalyptical. In any case, the Russian official rhetoric, the Russian actions, I mean the Kremlin actions, not only propaganda, but developments in Russia and outside of Russia, and of course, annexation of Crimea, and of course, invasion, Russian invasion in Ukraine, everything 
should be viewed not as a regional conflict, not as the Ukrainian crisis, come on, not as the geopolitical challenge, not only. It's the clash of civilizations. It's civilizational conflict with huge repercussions. And there should be clarity about this. No more postmodern fuzziness, ambivalence, etc. We have to be clear. We have conflict. We have clash. And, well, we are dealing with different normative systems clash. In fact, what uh, the Kremlin's war with Ukraine demonstrates, it demonstrates, in my view, especially after Putin clarified it just recently, and he continues to clarify it, we are dealing with the ultimatum, the Kremlin ultimatum to the community of liberal democracies, demanding the recognition of its right and the right of the stronger power to interpret the international rules of the game, to interpret and to undermine. Almost needless to say, this ultimatum already undermines a number of fundamental principles that maintained the order in the global community. And here I mean not only post-Cold War order that emerged after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1981, no. In fact, you know, what Russia is doing, Putin's Russia, not mine, Russia, or Leonid Gozman's Russia, what Russia is doing now, Russia is undermining the Helsinki Accord and the whole package of agreements. What is ironically, Russians, Russia is undermining also post-Yalta, Yalta Potsdam agreement with agreed areas of interest. And Russia is undermining Westphalian system with its emphasis on sovereignty and territorial integrity. And the global system, the system of global governance, Security Council, United Nations, uh, Council of Europe, EU, NATO, you name it, the rest, as well as, as the international legal framework, aimed to preserve and to preside uh, uh, the structure uh, that one of our friends called the end of history, proved unable, proved unable to respond to the crisis provoked by Russia. And all of this has turned the Russian attempt to preserve itself, to battle for its life uh, by undermining the existing order. It made Russia the challenge to the Western community. Regretfully, really regretfully, so far liberal democracies are much less prepared to resist the challenge, to face the challenge, to contain Russia. Why? Due to different circumstances. But first of all, because of the interdependence and growing interdependence between Russia and outside world. What Europe is going to do without Russia's gas, OK? Well, but not only because of this, but uh, also because the West has lost ability to provide, to lead, to handle and to do the ideolo ideological struggle to fight for its own principles. And apparently because of the nature of the Western leadership, just look, who are the leaders? These the leaders, these are the leaders of the status quo. I'm not going to uh, clamp down you know, uh, uh, on the names well and use the names. Well, but well, we have the model of the status quo leadership and status quo in the current situation when this, when you know, well, it, it, it starts to unravel, it's not healthy and it's not sustainable. So far, it seems to me that the leaders in the West are not right, are ready even to recognize the challenge and to name the challenge, that the challenge is confrontation, that the challenge is war. And here I have a quote hmm, from Obama. It will be the only quote from Obama. From Obama. He looks at the developments in Ukraine as not an invasion, but, and here I'm quoting, continuation of what's been taking place for months now. Wow. No comment. Apparently, apparently, you know, the Western political elite looks the current international crisis as a result of mere policy deviation, of uh, Putin's uh, fears, inadequacy. Remember, Angela Merkel said that Putin is not in this world. But maybe he's not. Well, but, you know, uh, it doesn't explain the current development and current, current, uh, current situation. Well, 
As a matter of fact, I wanted just to underline that what I see happening in the world is not the result of deviations or of, 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 uh, of crisis of leadership even in Russia. I see it as a product of development of the system that cannot, here I'm emphasizing it, cannot exist anymore in a state of peace. The crisis in Russia provoked in 2014 might, in my opinion, have much more serious consequences than the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. I cannot prove it now. You know, this is my argument. And so far, I have tentative explanation for that. Because, well, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 brought to the political scene Russia hoping to join Europe. And the 2014 Russo-Ukrainian war has demonstrated Russia's readiness to deter, to constrain, to restrain the West. That, according to my, my view, lost its vitality and uh, is fighting with its dysfunctionality. Russia's turn to opposing the weight highlights, as far as I see, two factors that the expert community, me including, did not sufficiently appreciate. And they are the uniqueness of the Russian civilization and its adaptive skills and the Western complacency with respect to the normative dimension after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Second segment of my talk, what are the characteristics of the Russian system and why it failed to transform itself. Very briefly, jumping from one bullet point to another. The first characteristic, you'll say, well, it's so trivial, a uh, tradition of unrestrained power. Well, but I would urge you to compare Russia and China, and you'll see that China, China has also tradition of tyranny, but it has always been restrained, both by meritocracy, Secondly, by moral taboos, the Chinese leaders were falling that, uh, you know, were produced uh, and grew out of Confucianism. And finally, the Francis Fukuyama. And again, what year it was, Mark? It was uh, 1984 Primacy of Culture article? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I was wrong about the date. But uh, because of the horizontal horizontal networks that glue the Chinese society, and you can jettison what is you know, above it and change the system for a different type of system, system like they did in Taiwan. What is more important when we are talking about Russia and Russian system, more important is the fact that Russia has always been militarized state. And here I don't have in mind military budget, well, well, it, five times bigger than, you know, usually, but it's not about military budget. It's not about the role of the military, you know, army has always been under control of the civilian leadership in Russia, Tsarist Russia, the Soviet Union, it's about something else. It's about the fact that Russian society has always been functioning, you know, has always been surviving as a military camp. So militarization as style of life has been uh, you know, our, our blood vessel system. And the Russian, sis, uh, Russian whole system uh, and, and uh, Russian history was a constant change of cycles from war to peace, and peace always was preparation for a new war, and then again war and again pause before militarization. And uh, comparing to other countries, also militarized countries, well, Prussia comes, comes to mind, someone said that you know, military, militarization and military industry is a Russia's profession and hobby. No, well, it's Russia's profession, it's Russian hobby. Russia was unable to use defeat, like many other countries did in 1917, and collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 to escape from the military paradigm. In 1993, Russia started a new war, the first Chechen war. And we have also to keep in mind two more characteristics of the Russian system. Well, territorially integrated empire. And it's very difficult to get out, to transform territorially integrated empire, especially frozen as it now, at the stage of collapse, or half frozen. Because in fact, you know, to get out of the empire status, ambition, tradition, we have to unravel the state. 
and even liberals are not ready to do that. And finally, the last stability of the Russian system that helps it to limp along is the ability of the authorities, of the ruling elite, of the political class to get all resources in one fist and its readiness and ability to decimate its own human potential, even now in our vegetarian times. So in, to some extent, you know, reading and re reading the Journal of Democracy, I read now our articles, it seems to me I was wrong, in, at least in those articles that you mentioned. Well, I still, I know, I'm coming to conclusion that uh, the Russian personalist power is a deviation when we are talking about, you know, the usual, the usual slot of authoritarian powers. It cannot, it, it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit the slot, okay? And not only because of tradition, but because of tradition, continuous, continuous, you know, and, uh, and replicates the state. And in any case, in any case, in any case, known recipes of transformation that we used in Eastern Europe, well, Estonia, Baltic states, uh, Latin America, pacted transitions, imposed tran transitions, Philip Schmitter, Guillermo Donald, they do not fit. Does it mean that Putin is right when he tries to persuade the world, Russia and himself, that Russia is doomed to continue along the road of exceptionalism? I don't know. I hope not. I really don't know. I'm here with those. I'm looking at Larry Diamond. I'm, I'm looking at you folks. I'm, 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 maybe I'm an idealist. I'm with those who believe that uh, leadership, leadership, political engineering, readiness of the political elite, to subjugate its appetites to the rule of law uh, could compensate for the lack of democratic uh, prerequisites. Looking at South Africa, looking at India, looking at Taiwan and Eastern Europe, Latin America, different countries with different cultural code. They did it. In Russia, not. And it seems to me there is one explanation. At least it's crude explanation. In one minute you cannot do that, but I will try. In Russia, the country, population, the nation, society has become hostage and victim of its intellectual class and political class. If liberal, liberal trends in Russia were cut short in 1917 during the October Revolution because the society was not ready for rule of law, transparency, and dignity. In the early 90s, Russia fell victim of intellectuals, of us liberals, of the political elite, because, paraphrasing von Hayek, because we have chosen fixers, but not fixed principles. Good people, but not normative dimension. The survival of the Russian system also points to another fact as well. Favorable international environment that emerged around Russia in the 90s that enabled adaptability, resilience, and, recipro and, uh, and reproduction, yes, reproduction of the Russian system. The Kremlin has skillfully, you know, it's very interesting, rule of law belongs to the 16th century, and these guys are so, uh, so skillful, dapped, so well, so um, unbelievably, unbelievably skillful, you know, with technologies of the 21st century. In any case, they skillfully exploit it post-Cold War lack of clear ideological lines. On the one hand, Russia has managed to preserve one-man rule that has become constantly, you know, more and more aggressive, assertive, and anti-Western. But on the other, Russia has become a member of all these Western clubs, muddling the principles. And Russia itself, as I've mentioned, 16th century and 21st century became an example of muddling the principles. In any case, the Western ideological ambiguity, Western ideological ambiguity, the so-called post-modernity, has become the best environment for the Russian game, let's pretend. And here is the paradox, one of many, the Soviet Union that, well, that I worked for, the Soviet Union sustained itself by containing the West. And from the moment of collapse of the Soviet Union until 2013, and this date is very important, 2013, the Russian system sustained itself by imitating the West, by penetrating the fabric of the Western society, by co-opting the Western elite. 
And it's worth noting maybe now, uh, and this is, I'm uh, wrapping this segment. It's interesting, I, I don't know, I, I, apparently I will have to write about this, or maybe someone much clever and much more sophisticated will write about this. You know, uh, 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 there are so many examples when countries much more uh, different than the Western European civilization, traditionally, culturally, in its past, etc., they succeeded to uh, they succeeded to mimic and to adopt the Western political principles and the Western uh, uh, institutional structure, starting with the 19th century major restoration. And East uh, Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, they borrowed the model of governance. Russia has borrowed broadly, actively, energetically, all the time, during all its history, at least starting with Peter the Great, technology. Technology, but not political principles, and always return to the state of confrontation with the West. Thirdly, reincarnation of the Russian system. A, a, just a, an example of amazing adaptability. When the Tsarist shell crumbled in 1917, you know, the political system, Russian system of personalized power, swamped the monarchic and divining legitimation of power for one based on Marxist ideology. When the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, it assumed a new incarnation by dumping the state, the Soviet Union, the USSR, and adopting anti-communist legitimacy. From the time of the Soviet collapse until recently, the, Soviet, the Russian regime, the core, the core uh, of the Russian political system was based on the, on, was based on the following premise. It declared adherence to Western norms and its elite integrated into Western society on a personal level. For a portion of its reign, Putin has maintained the hybrid regime Marx has mentioned. And it seems to me it started in 2004 with the Orange Revolution in Ukraine and openly during Munich's speech in 2007 when the Russian authorities, mainly for domestic reasons, but again, Ukraine, Ukraine was a trigger for boarding it was a signal to do something inside of Russia. Russia has started to turn in an opposite direction. And Obama Medvedev reset and in new Russia partnership for modernization, uh, modernization policy was a kind of apparently tactical interval that has not changed the Russian system trajectory. By the end of 2013, before, before the war with Ukraine, the Kremlin stopped its dressing up games adopting a new Putin's doctrine. And in fact, Putin returned. He returned post-communist Russia to the period before the collapse of the Soviet Union, to the Soviet Union when we are talking about survival mechanism. And uh, I just made here a note. Remember Albert Einstein. And here I have in mind his warning that comes to mind. The biggest stupidity is to repeat the same and hope that the result will be different. Several circumstances apparently forced the Kremlin to change its survival paradigm. And I will briefly mention them. Firstly, the emergence in Russia of the new political regime headed by Putin, but this is a regime totally unique in the Russian history. You know, Siloviki, the armed people, the special services people, in fact, uh, Praetorian dogs, okay, that have to guard the palace, the dust the dose to the Kremlin. They never ruled Russia, never. It was Russian history. They were always controlled by civilian leadership. For the first time, they are rulers of the country of the nuclear state, and they combine repressive mechanisms, uh, uh, power and property in one hand. It never happened before. There is another reason why apparently Putin has changed the doctrine of survival. The rise of the protest activity in 2011-12, and apparently there is also, but uh, we have just to test whether it's so or not, apparently Kremlin's decision to prepare the coercion machine before the new protest surfaces. And of course, there definitely was another reason, another reason for this change of the paradigm. It was the attempt of Putin and the Kremlin to use the benevolent in international situation, to use where the situation when weaklings were in power in Europe, at least in Europe, and uh, to use the Western leadership complacent regarding the Kremlin agenda to change their paradigm of survival. 
Uh, now the new paradigm is based on one pre premise, and it's different premise from the previous. The West is in terminal decline. That's the premise of the Kremlin strategy now. And by declaring the end of liberal democracies, Vladimir Putin closed pro-Western period in the Russian history beginning in 1991. And Ukrainian crisis didn't only allow Putin to change and to test the paradigm now he's testing. He allowed, uh, the, the, this war and annexation of Crimea allowed Putin to use patriotic, military patriotic mobilization that the Russian leadership never used to such extent, slightly during the Chechen wars, but never to such extent during the last 20 years. And for the first time, for the first time, uh, the president and the Kremlin has used the ethnical Russian card. Uh, uh, I hope that they will try uh, uh, to use it cautiously afterward because they do understand in the Kremlin the ethnical Russian card, Russian world, Russian nationalism. It's a bomb under the construct of the current Russian empire. Anyway, Putin disproved two commonly held beliefs at least among part of the intellectual spectrum and community. Some thought that the Russian authoritarianism will be, you know, um, instrument of liberal reforms. Some thought that this authoritarianism could be pro-Western. It became clear during the last couple of years. The Russian system could reproduce itself only as authoritarian, maybe dictatorial, and anti-Western civilization. And the final point, do I have my five minutes? The final point, the most difficult one, decay, agony, revolution. Well, the Russian system in its current incarnation or reincarnation meets all key criteria for decay. And I'm looking at Mark, and I will skip over one part of my presentation where I'm quoting my favorite authors. Arnold Toynbee Olson, Burke Huntington, Fukuyama, Amartya Sen, they all prove that the way Russia develops now, the uh, way Russian system projects itself now, the way Russia deals with the outside world and with its own population, and the way Russia defends itself, you know, they're all signs that Russia is moving in the direction opposite from freedom, dignity, rule of law, and demonstrates all signs of decay. The question is, for me, and I have no answer to this question, what kind of stage of decay Russian political system is on? Is it a, a, a far advanced decay? Has the system reached the stage of agony then we have to use other criteria. Hardly Russia will repeat the destiny of the Ottoman Empire 300 years of decay and degradation. Well, in fact, Putin, you know, <clears throat> unfolded, unleashed the process that accelerate not only degradation, but accelerate, you know, all process in Russia. But if it's not the agony of the system, that it could be, could it be the agony of the political regime and leadership? And another question, Russian system has reached the stage when it would be useful, constructive, and high time. We are late, we are too late to raise this question. Is Russian system going, and Russia with the system, is going to start the long process of rot, irreversible rot, uh, uh, fragmentation? and, well, and gradual death, or the system will explode, or maybe some of the system will explode. I don't have the answers uh, for this question, and it seems to me that reality will soon give us the grounds for the answers. In any case, it's totally clear now that the Kremlin will operate within the militarist deterrence model in its relations with the outside world. And any compromise that this system in Russia, the Kremlin, is making with the West, is making with the outside world and environment, could be temporary. So it's, it's the nature of the trap. True, you can say, well, you can play the devil's advocate and say, but just look, 
the system and the Kremlin have some potential to survive. They have some means in the toolkit, and I would agree. The natural rent commodities, well, possibility to co-opt the audience outside of Russia, selective repressions, the fact uh, you know, that Russia can play the role of the spoiler and blackmail, nuclear blackmail, especially now. This is apparently the newest trick. And there is another trend which we have to be very cautious of and we have to an analyze. Analytically, it's very interesting to, to watch it. And this trend demonstrates that we are wrong if we compartmentalize domestic and foreign policy. Because at the moment, uh, the domestic uh, instruments and functions of the Russian political regime dwindle, continue to dwindle. And the Russian system tries to find other resources outside. So foreign policy, in other words, foreign policy is becoming the key, the crucial instrument of the Russian system survival, which makes the survival of the system international civilization, so civilizational and geopolitical factor. Well, uh, uh, at the same time, I, I want, I'm just looking, I'm skipping over my points because I do believe that I'm looking into your eyes, you are tired of me, and I definitely, I definitely need, I definitely need, after confessing, you know, my own inability to give an adequate correct answer and inability to produce some positive recipes, I need to find something at least, uh, you know, to counterbalance this rather murky, rather apocalyptic picture. And I, I think that I, I, I have it. I have what Raymond Aron called the law, iron law, he said. Iron law of, iron law of unintended consequences. As I mentioned before, everything that the Kremlin and Putin are doing <coughs> now, they bring, they could bring still tactical gains, tactical victories. Tactically, they have won in Ukraine you know, they still keep in Ukraine. They still, they still, they still have possibility to undermine its territorial sovereignty, its well-being, and keep Ukraine, you know, at least in the shadow or in the pocket. Or even Finland desires Ukraine. It's, isn't it a tactical victory? Donetsk and Lugansk republics soon will have its elections, and Russia will endorse them. And definitely, it's the second partition of Ukraine after Crimea. Crimea lost part of the, of the east, of, the, of its own east Donbass, isn't it? A tactical victory. But, you know, Raymond Arons and uh, the iron logic of the law of unintended consequences tells us that, you know, you can have tactical victories that are bringing in the future strategic disasters. And this is what is happening in Russia. Yes, military patriotic mobilization brought Putin 85, 84, 89% of approval rating. Huh. But at the same time, you know, military patriotic mobilization starts to exhaust its resources. A, a, a economy is shrinking, sanctions have been biting, and in before that, economy has been in a state of recession, stagnation, some say crisis. And Russians have become already economic subjects. They want well-being. They're not people from the Stalinist era. And as Alexis de Tocqueville once reminded, I'm paraphrasing him, revolutions have been made not by poor people, but by people who were not fed once. So well, another factor, uh, criminalization. One more factor, corruption. And now we see that 37%, yes, 86% still approve activity and, you know, leadership of President Putin. But 80, 80, 80, 87 percent of Russians are saying now that they would prefer that the interests of individuals are much more important than the interests of the state. So Putin has lost this 37 percent. And among those people who support him, 60% believe that the government is lousy and good for nothing. 75% believe that even the highest echelons of authority are totally corrupted. So, well, yes, they have also cognitive dissonance. And, you know, when we are talking about 
about possible about possible growth of uh, the, the famous book uh, uh, gr uh, gra gra grapes of wrath it all comes suddenly out of the blue yesterday he or she were just gossiping at the kitchen and in the evening he or she could go to the maidan fighting for dignity it helps it comes unexpectedly and moreover calm always political is very illusional deceptive calm is always political calm is always deceptive especially in the situation where the society have now have no channels to express political channels to express it inter its interests moods it so, and so on so calm is a foreboding that something might happen and the last several things well, Putin's trap. Uh, this is not the subject for my narrative, apparently, but if I were mm, knowledgeable in psychology, definitely I would write something about that. Because this is, this is what we have. This is systemic trap. This is systemic trap uh, that not only Putin, but his own entourage, you know, got uh, themselves into. And it seems to me there is no exit from this trap. Or maybe it's already political grave. On the one hand, they cannot backtrack on Ukraine. They cannot backtrack when we are talking about military patriotic mobilization. They cannot get out of the war mood. So Putin has to end as a war president. On the other hand, on the other hand, he has no means to continue. And he has used all trump cards that were up his sleeve. He cannot continue firstly, because in order to uh, uh, prolong to uh, reproduce military patriotic mobilization, war climate, war atmosphere. He has to have idea. There is no idea like it was during the Stalin's time. There is no uh, reliable uh, repressive instruments. That's why, for instance, when we have the people taken to the street in 2011-12, they brought, they brought the riot police from Hantima and Sikh. They don't trust, you know, the, the Russian Spetsnaz and riot police. And, uh, and besides, and besides, uh, and besides, you know, there is something else. There is something else. The country that has been more or less free, it cannot be, you know, uh, uh, turned down into the closet again. So there is no possibility to, uh, maybe the silver lining, no possibility for any kind of long-term military dictatorship. And... The final thing, of course, those people in the Kremlin do understand the situation. Of course, they do understand that apparently somehow they're cornered. They do understand that their strategy is what are we going to do in the evening? They don't have the strategy. And apparently what they're what they're ready to, what they will do, it's a kind of change, preemptive strike, change of the political leader and the regime to save the system. It happened so many times in history. It could happen now. But here we have conundrum. Any new leader in Russia, as a result of a coup, some cleansing, change of the regime, will face again this dilemma, either to reform the country or to continue the war presidency. But the major drama is that he cannot, any leader cannot, reform country from the top. Basta. The spirit is ended. The current political establishment merged in all these problems, including liberals. They cannot do any pact transition, which means, which means that we are back in the 19th century with the tradition of the 19th century. And what tradition I have in mind? I have in mind the tradition of revolution, a revolutionary outburst. And the only hope that in Russia, if revolution happens, it will be something like glorious revolution, but not French revolution of the 18th century and October revolution of the 20th century. But even in case our segment that some of its representative are here today from Russia, if the liberal democratic segment finally wins in Russia and starts to look around for agenda of the reforms, we'll have two challenges before us and before the segment. Maybe it will come after, after I finish my memoirs. One challenge, how to break, how to break out of its present state format, of the format of territorial integrated empire, 
because Russia in the current state cannot exist with civilizationally alien segments like Northern Caucasus, etc. Russia has to reformat itself, and it will be a very painful task to change the format of the state if somebody risks it. And second problem that the reformers will be facing is to reform a nuclear state, because Russian nuclear capability now and in the future definitely will fuel the Russian elite's global ambitions and could serve as a safety net protecting the personalized system. Thus, the challenge of Russia's nuclear petrostate at the stage of decay, or maybe at the stage of agony already, we don't know, agony or decay. Maybe the next issue of Journal of Democracy and American Interest would be devoted to this issue, criteria for decay. So this challenge apparently could become the main challenge of the 21st century. And it's up to us, intellectual community, political community, my friends here, net, to ensure the world realizes the seriousness of the challenge and will adequately, adequately respond to it. And here I am finishing my vignette. Sorry for being too long, but you were silent. <laughs> I am returning, Sydney, I am returning to Seymour Martin Lipsitz, his great personality and his legacy, which needs to be rewrite many times. And his legacy and his biography and his efforts could give us a recipe on how to deal with the formidable challenges we are facing today. We need to think according to according to what I understand in his writings. We need to think about freedom and truth as the highest values, even when pragmatism, conformism, and acquiescence are much more comfortable and profitable. And with this, I end my lecture. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, Lilia, for a... I found only two people sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they did it. Uh, you were one of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, it uh, was such a rich uh, discussion, uh, but I'm sure it will have provoked many questions from people. We have two microphones. Anyone who has a question, please just uh, line up by the mics. And please identify yourself. Uh, for asking first. Mr. Rasvi Ishoris. My question is uh, directed towards your uh, ending, which is how does the curtain fall on, on the Putin uh, interregnum? And I direct it to a comparative political analysis. In Weimar, on the right, Carl Schmitt Spengler, who you mentioned, and others, the reactionary fascist right, what they did was to undermine liberal democracy and essentially destroy its meaning from within so that osmosis occurred. They ceased to function as political parties because they have radicalized so much of the rest of society. In Russia, I submit to you, not just Dugan, he's, you know, Dugan's Dugan, but nation, uh, national unity, the other fascist elements that started in the 90s, what they have done is infiltrate political discourse and therefore marginalize themselves, but when Zhuganov now, unknowingly as a communist, is using the Duganist language about moder attacking modernists. They don't even know that they have in fact embraced this. And my question to you is, if this perspective is even remotely possible in both the Spenglerian, Schmidian, and Heidegger too, all of those scenarios ended in the desire for Gottdameron. Right, they forward or back, binary thinking, no retreat. Do you believe that that thinking has permeated Bortnikov, uh, Sergei Ivanov, the others close with who decided to go to war in Ukraine? Do they have this thinking, and does that mean we can expect that kind of end game? Uh, uh, should I respond? Uh, sh uh, respond now, or Charles? 
Uh, well, as all we can take a few, if you'd rather. You oh, want me oh, to take yeah, a couple? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That doesn't mean that I have the answer. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we go to Harley over there and then. Okay, thank you. Uh, Harley Balzer, Georgetown University. Uh, will you, in the middle of your talk, you talked a little bit about some of the public opinion numbers. And I was wondering if you could kind of go uh, back. Could you, uh, Harley, could you, uh, louder, because. Louder, uh, is that better? Yeah. All right, closer, sorry. It, uh, you talked a little bit about some of the public opinion numbers. Uh, I'd love to have you go back to that. Uh, you know, Putin's support is 90%. Uh, George H.W. Bush hit 90% in the first Gulf War. 14 months later, he lost an election. Uh, if you ask Russians if they would vote for Putin again, the number is closer to 50%. The number who want to pay for Ukraine is around 12 or 13%. Uh, so, you know, how deep is, is this support for the president? Mm -hmm. Charles? Uh, Ch Charles Gatti, uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Lily, your penetrating talk. Thank you very much. I uh, was Mike looking at you, Charles, <laughs> <laughs> and thinking, what would you say about <laughs> Orban's Hungary? Uh, I'm not bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's a mini Putin. You mentioned the American interest. I had an article. And yeah. the article and the, uh, the article. Author, authors put it there, mini Putin. That was <laughs> not my idea, but it was a good one. <laughs> uh, I'd like you to consider uh, two American sayings which are not compatible with one another. One uh, says, every country gets uh, the leaders it deserves. There is another saying, the more or less the opposite, more or less the opposite, that uh, the people are good, the leaders are bad. Which one of these would you apply to today's Russia? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I think we should take the remaining two. I only see okay. two more, so oh. Leonid and then Aria. Well, uh, I'm, I'm Leonid Gozman, and I'm a fellow of National Endowment for Democracy now for a short period. And uh, Lilia, I would like to say that I would like to thank you for, uh, for such brilliant presentation. It's the first time I hear uh, such a long, uh, such a long your speech. And it's, I'm sorry. And it's terrific. <laughs> and it's terrific. No, it's terrific. So thank you very much. You said, uh, you mentioned myself, you said that uh, this Russia which made an aggression now, it's not your Russia, it's not my Russia. It's right and wrong at the same time. It's right because, of course, um, either you or me uh, never supported uh, such uh, criminal and crazy behavior. But at the same time, it's wrong because uh, you will return back to Moscow, uh, me too, and uh, uh, there are our soldiers, uh, our compatriots in Ukraine now. It's our president who lies uh, to, uh, to the world and who lies to its own country. Uh, so it's, um, it's our Russia, unfortunately, it's our Russia. And uh, your analysis is very sad uh, because it's because it's it's truth the reality reality is very sad but we have some hope i think you know uh, the french psychologist prominent french psychologist serge moscovici he created a concept of active minorities he said that only uh, minorities change change the life and i think that we have a hope until uh, some people come, uh, for example, to today's ceremony, uh, 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 reading uh, the names of those who were killed by communists. And uh, several hours ago, I received a photo from Moscow uh, when the nine-year-old boy reads these names on Lubyanka Square. And I'm very proud that it's my grandson. Uh, I think it's... Uh, I'm really proud. Uh, uh, and, but I have a question for you, and it's... It's not a question about the figures. It's an existential question. Well, you and me, and some other our compatriots from, from this hall, will return to Russia. What can we do? What must we do? Thank you. You, Thank want, you. you want a political memorandum <laughs> from me? <laughs> yes, very short, just for 40 minutes, not more. <laughs> You know, Leonid, then I will ask you to do that because <laughs> while you belong to the political circles, I'm just an expert. So it's <laughs> up to you to give me a kind of political agenda of what should I do being in Russia. <laughs> but I will respond. 
last hour. R.L. Cohen, Center for Energy, Natural Resources, and Geopolitics. Lily, a terrific tour de horizon, and just to shift to the foreign- But wrong, I know. No, no, no. But <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. To shift to the foreign and, and diplomatic and security aspects outside and around Russia. In a crisis situation, the prolonged, protracted crisis situation that you describe, what is the role of China, the simmering conflict with the Islamic world? Because you pretty much discount the West as lack, lackluster or, or lacking leadership. What are the s external factors that may come and influence these scenarios, these outcomes, as they did in previous systemic crises of Russia, be it six, early 1600s, 1917, 1921, and 1991, and the early 90s. Um, esp especially, you did not talk much about the Islamic factor in China, if you could. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I already know that I don't. <laughs> I don't know the answer nice, to your final question. question. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, <laughs> let me uh, let me uh, make an attempt to give my bullet points to the questions and uh, really appreciate the questions. Does Carl Schmitt's psychology mentality doctrine has dominated the most important part of the Russian elite? I will just quote Carl Schmitt that is pretty popular among the Russian experts in Russian websites close to the Kremlin. As you know, Carl Schmitt was one of the most popular Nazi, Nazi ideologues in the 30s. And one of the, uh, uh, Carl Schmitt's recipes was the more actively and energetically you undermine the rules of the game, the more you raise legitimacy of the sovereign. And in fact, what the Kremlin did in Crimea and Ukraine, it was undermining the rules of the game that really indeed has raised legitimacy, uh, maybe fake legitimacy, maybe artificial imitation legitimacy, but definitely approval rating. Yes, this is Smithsonian, Karl and Smithsonian <laughs> approach. Whether it dominates or not, you know, I don't have access to the, not to the first, not to the second, even to the third round of hyenas around the Kremlin, but I can give you a kind of imagin imaginative answer. According, apparently, to the logic of the balance of forces around the Kremlin, I would say such a uh, Schmitzonian psychology of the gods, Praetorians close to the regime that see that the Achilles still guarantees of their well-being. Apparently, they would follow the principle. Apparently, if they ever read Carl Schmitt, he will be there, not Dugin. Dugin is a, a bit different. He will be their mm, guru. But there is another part, uh, of, there are so many Russians. We were talking with Leonid, there is his Russia, mine Russia, some others Russia. But there are, uh, for the first time after the collapse of the Soviet Union, well, in this, during the last two years, we have definitely different segments of the elite. One elite is conservative isolationist, military industrial complex, ready to close the borders and enjoy themselves in Sochi. Another part of elite lives in London Grad. It's, uh, you know, the elite that has absorbed the Western style of life, has penetrated the fabric of the Western society, schmoozes in Aspen with the uh, American oligarchs like uh, uh, Angela, what's his name? Abramovich. Like Abramovich somehow changed London for Aspen out of the blue. So I wonder whether they would support Carl Schmidt as their guru, okay? So that definitely s could, uh, could be possible split within the elite. It's not necessarily, because as I've mentioned, we don't know what's going to come tomorrow and how this whole situation will impact the balance of forces. But theoretically, you know, the elite 
uh, if we take their interests and their relationship to the West and cooptation with the West, it's different, okay? Secondly, Harley, uh, you know, I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit hypocritical. I'm using numbers. I'm using the numbers of the polls. And at the same time, I do not believe totally in the results of the polls because I do believe that when the public opinion is made by TV and there is no mechanism of cleansing the public opinion from the TV propaganda, you are not having the real result, you know, that uh, will tell you what really people are thinking. And I wonder whether someone could have such a mechanism. This is firstly. Secondly, the society in such a demoralized, atomized situation like we have now, it never existed in this situation, even during the last Soviet period of life that I remember. 84% believing that Russia is surrounded by enemies. In 1989, 1989, yes, 1989, only 13% of Soviets believed that Russia was surrounded by enemies and most of the enemies were inside. So you see the difference. So I wonder to what extent the support, the approval ratings are fine, especially when we take into account that not a single pollster, even our pollsters, uh, became, uh, well, they were right uh, predicting the results of the elections. I don't know, I don't want to, 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 to mention the names. So, but I would, and especially when the polls are being done in the following way, as you know, uh, the pollster knocks, knocks uh, at the door of the apartment and asks, not the name of the person who is registered, but he's asking the following question. Are you registered here? That means that he knows the name and everything. And can you imagine Mr. Ivanov, when the post is coming, whether he would say, no, I don't approve President Putin in the current situation. <laughs> so while well, I hardly believe that 88% of Mr. Ivanov's really do support Putin, but I do believe that the number 37% of people polled Russian respondents who say that they prefer not the interest of the state but the interest of individuals, this poll is rather adequate, okay? Uh, Charles, as always, Charles Gatti paradoxes. I love Charles Gatti paradoxes. <laughs> well, he he's my favorite writer, by the way, with typical Hungarian sense. Well, it's a, uh, well, just comparing you to Poles, to Estonians, you are the you are a unique one. Whether what city I would choose, every country deserves, or the leader is bad, uh, the people are good. You know, uh, I don't like ambiguity and fuzziness, uh, as I've mentioned, and you force me to be fuzzy and ambivalent because I do believe that I do believe that even now, demoralized, frustrated Russian society lost totally its trajectory. I don't know what could come out of this society. Nobody knows. Nobody can give us, you know, the prediction for tomorrow. But it seems to me, if the real alternative and the political force supporting this alternative and this force is trusted by the society, has means to address the society, TV, yes, and the rest, is offering this alternative to, to the society. Well, the society can uh, accept rule of law state, still can. M even not 15, 17% of us, for Andrea Leron of Leonid Gozman is here, seems to me someone more from our community, not even 15, 17% of liberals, but much more people, just like majority of the people at the beginning of 90s were ready to endorse, to support rule of law state. The problem is that they were offered something else. So, well, that's my answer. Leonid, what could we offer Moscow and Russia when we return back to Moscow and Russia. I will definitely ca can offer two things. I will wait for you to form a political party <laughs> that I will fight for. And secondly, I will be doing, I will be doing what I've been doing so far. I've been, I will be doing my writing, talking inside of Russia and outside of Russia. That's what I can, that's what I know. But if there is a party, that I can support. Well, so far, 
Uh, I'm supporting the December 12th, uh, uh, I'm sorry, well, it's, uh, December 12th forum, well, I will continue to do that uh, without much platform and without much memorandum. So there was someone else. Ah, yes, Ariel, Ariel. Your question was about, about yourself. <laughs> because everybody knows that Ariel is doing China, Arabs, oil, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about Arabs and, uh, you know, confrontation <laughs> with Arab civilization, but you put me, and I'm going to use you as an expert when I need it, but there is a very serious thing that you raised, really. If really, and thank you, if really we are dealing with a new civilization clash, well, everybody's tired of this word, but still it is. The problem is that the West does not recognize it yet. But if we are dealing with conflict uh, of the civilization level, the end and outcome of the conflict and how it will proceed in the future depends on where China is going to be. And if Ming Sen Pei is right that China's, the Chinese system is losing its resilience but still has a possibility of trick and trick, well, and apparently it's the problem of 20 years, then China could be this factor that, of course, will be a powerful player in this civilization clash. On which side, we don't know, whether it's the Russian side or uh, the Western side. In any case, Russia is going to be, according to Brzezinski, a junior partner. Thank you for your book, Charlie. Mm -hmm. A junior partner of China. Regarding the Arabs, I'm not sure that uh, civil, uh, they do matter, they do matter apparently. Oil, gas, geopolitically, but civilizationally, I'm afraid I don't find any kind of role for them in this kind of context. Did, I didn't say the word Arabs. What, did, what I, and you said what? You said, uh, you it's mentioned only like China? Islam, and that's Russia. Ah, Islam, ah, sorry. Somehow looking at you, I thought about Arabs. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Islam. Sorry, you know, by the end of the day, I uh, could be coming crude. <laughs> Islam, you're right. And Islam means that if the current policy of the leadership has no solution for radicalization of the Russian Tatar, Bashkatarstan, North Caucasian uh, Islamic movement, they are preparing several bombs behind the construction. And it will make Tatarstan and Bashkatarstan even more complicated to include, integrate as part maybe of future confederation into the new context of the Russian state. If, if we start the transformation process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lilith, for a great performance. Thank you. Thank you. And you're now welcome to join us at a reception, which I think is just upstairs, is that right? <laughs>